Come on, Brother Juan. Hey, real quick, hug somebody's neck, shake their hand, and tell them you're glad you got to see them tonight. Tell somebody you're glad you made it through Wednesday. Hey, girl. <laughs> Amen. Look at somebody say, tell them be glad for Jesus. Come on now, say be glad for Jesus. Amen. 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 I see that most of y'all didn't grow up in a in a, a African American Baptist church. Amen. Somebody says be glad for Jesus. You got to get loud. Look at somebody and say, "I said be glad for Jesus." Amen. 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 Go ahead. Somebody shut them back doors. I don't want too much of this leaking out tonight. Amen. Get your Bible open to Revelation chapter twenty-two. Let's jump right in the middle of a, of the, a mystery message tonight. You got blanks to fill in, even on the title tonight. I want to show you a message or some words in Revelation 22, verses 12 through 16. We're going to talk about by might. We're going to talk about by might. Me and me, write it down. We're going to talk about by right. And we're going to talk about by light. By might, by right. And by light. If you got it, say, I got it. Say it back to me. Bye. 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 Amen. What in the world are we talking about? We're talking about promises and statements that the Lord makes that he either makes out of his authority or he makes out of his ability to bring a thing forth or he makes out of his ability to create uh, clarity, direction in our lives. And, uh, and promises that he makes that move us from light to dark. Now, most of y'all have been with us on, on Wednesday nights as we've been studying through the book of Revelation. I know some of you are just now getting to come on, on Wednesday nights and you're kind of jumping in at the end of the book. But, but what's happening in Revelation 22 is God is reminding us of the promises he's made in the book. He's reminding us of the big things. He's reminding us of the end things. The, uh, the, the children of God are in the eternal state. This is where God is moving us to, tribulation over, millennium over, a, a short time that Satan is released, whatever time that is, we don't know how long it is, that time is over, the great white throne judgments have taken place, everything is settled, all the accounts are settled, the justice bar of God is appeased on every level, and Revelation 22 is telling us about last things, and as we looked last Sunday morning, we looked at at, at, the, at, the, at the last things that God wants us to see. Now, if the Lord is willing, then on Sunday, Sunday morning, this coming Sunday morning, we will conclude our study of the book of Revelation. I just really, in praying about it, I just couldn't hardly get past the, the invitation that is given, the Spirit and the bride say come, without, without saying it to as many potential lost people as, I, as we possibly could. And so that's the real reason why we wanted to, to, to move that to Sunday, uh, to Sunday morning and talk a little bit about it. And then, uh, and then Lord willing, um, I don't know if I'm going to preach an intermediary sermon or two, um, or we may jump straight into the book of Romans, uh, praying a lot and studying and thinking a lot about whether we would go into Romans on Wednesday nights or the book of Genesis. But I know that you've touched on Genesis most recently compared to Romans uh, in your life groups and in the gospel project. And I know that was relatively fresh on your mind as we touched on it in the summer and the fall. And uh, so what we're going to do is, um, uh, uh, is, is begin in the book of Romans. It may take us, uh, I could see it taking uh, as long and maybe twice as long as it has took us to go through the book of Revelation, which has taken us coming on about a year and a half we began back in the summer of 2015 and now we're of course in the uh, about to turn the page on 2016 and uh, it could take us uh, probably uh, uh, a year and a half to probably at least two years uh, there is so much within the book really so much of what God laid on the apostle Paul's heart in life and ministry and in mystery is revealed to us in Romans he, uh, while, while, of course, he talks about other things in specifics in other books, uh, 80 to 90% of everything the Apostle Paul said 
under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is at least touched upon in the book of Romans. And uh, uh, I told you a couple of weeks ago uh, that if there's five books you need to have a working knowledge of as a Christian, within the first five years of you being saved, you need to have your own personal abilities in the book of Genesis, in the book of Psalms, in the book of John, in the book of Romans, and in the book of Revelation. Now, those of you that have been studying with us, you have accomplished uh, the part uh, on, on Revelation. I hope that it's been a blessing to you in, in some way. I hope that you've grown closer to the Lord in it, and I'm praying that that's what will be happening as we look into great truth, uh, Lord willing, in, uh, in the book of Romans. But as we are concluding Revelation and we're seeing statements made, we see three primary statements that are made by the Lord. And in particular here, we see the Lord Jesus himself interjecting a lot into the message. We know from what Jesus has told us and John told us in the early stages of the book that the revelation was given by the Lord Jesus to an angel. And the angel and angels, we found as we studied the book, relayed them to the Apostle John, and the Apostle John speaks them forth. But while he has been getting this vision and getting this revelation, there have been times where the Lord Jesus himself begins to speak and the angel grows silent, amen, as we all ought to do when the Lord begins to speak, amen. We can be speaking a good thing, but when the Lord speaks to us is when we need to be quiet, we need to follow the words of, of Solomon in Ecclesiastes, you are God in heaven, I am here on earth, Lord, I'm going to let my words be few. And so we see the angel here, and we looked at it in verse 7 on Sunday morning, but we see again, and we're going to see tonight, two times, where the Lord Jesus interjects himself even into his own revelation to do what? To put an explanation mark on what's being said. Does that make sense? Is that, might, is that might be a sense? You know, uh, Vice President-elect uh, Pence is in charge, they tell me, of the transition team uh, for President-elect Trump. And I'm sure in some of those meetings he's talking about those details, but every now and then I imagine, especially knowing what I've seen of Mr. Trump, I would imagine him to interject. And so he's probably interjecting, and when he does, what he's communicating is, now this is something I want done, right? So that's on a much lower level, but we see the same, the same thing occurring here. Jesus is giving this to an angel, but then he, he puts an explanation mark on it. And so we need to watch those things, and that's what we're going to do tonight. In fact, two of the three things that we're going to examine tonight are specifically spoken to us by the Lord. So be looking and begin with me in verse 12. Jesus is speaking here, and he says, and behold, and this is right after he said what last Sunday morning? Let him who is what? Righteous or rather unjust, let him be unjust still, filthy, filthy still, righteous, righteous still, holy, holy still, right? He says, and behold, and that's the same thing he said in verse 7. Look now, and he is going to basically say the same thing. Verse 7, he said, behold, I'm coming quickly. Look at what he says again. And behold, I am coming quickly. And we ought to be living with the idea that we are a heartbeat away from eternity, whether the Lord comes and calls us or he calls us home in death. Amen? Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, and here's the Lord speaking again, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Dear Heavenly Father, give us words to utter and give us ears to hear. And we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Look with me there on your outline at verses 12 
and 13, and we talk about two things. The Lord is talking about a promise, and he's talking about a power. He's talking about a promise, and he's talking about the power. Behold, I am coming quickly. That is a promise. My reward is with me. That is a promise. What's he going to do with that reward? He's going to give it to everyone according to their work. Here he is primarily talking to saved people. He is pointing us to the fact that we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Even if we're saved, God help those that are lost. We know from the great white throne judgment study in Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 11 through 15, we see that they, if they're not in the Lamb's book of life, they're going to be judged according to the book of works, right? Y'all remember that? But, but here he's, he's making a broad statement, and it includes us, okay? If, if, if he's given us something, we need to be faithful with what he's given us, amen? What does Paul say? Having received this ministry, we faint not. We don't quit on what the Lord has given us to do, amen? We know the Lord's going to take care of things. We know even in this world we're going to have difficulties, but we are a people that are going to be resurrected. We are a people that, absent from the body, are going to live with the Lord, and one day our bodies are going to be resurrected. And 1 Corinthians tells us that, that this corruptible is going to put on incorruption, this mortal is going to put on immortality, and we are going to be before the Lord. And he says in verse 57 of 1 Corinthians 15, right, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so what does verse 58 say? Does it, can anybody tell me? It starts with the words, wherefore. Because we've been given the victory through Jesus, what does verse 58 say? 1 Corinthians 15. That is a chapter you need to know. If there's 20 chapters in the Bible you need to know. 1 Corinthians 15 is one of them. You can't walk in and out of cemeteries without 1 Corinthians 15. What does verse 58 say? Wherefore... My beloved brethren, oh, I see Brother David's helping y'all out. I, see, I got my cheat sheet back there on the back wall myself. Y'all got, got three of them. I got one of them. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It is going to accomplish something. It is known. God knows the sacrifices you make for him. God knows. Um, what that you could be spending your tithe money on something else. God knows that you could be spending your time on, on, on other things, but you have, you, have, you have elevated his position in your life, and, and the Lord says, for that, my reward is with me. He basically makes in this statement a threefold um, acclamation. One, he says he will return. He says he will return. This world is going to go the way that the Lord has said it will go. He is the master of it all. He rises up nations and he brings them down. No one on this planet sits in any authority without, without that having been approved and even relegated by the Lord. Even in ungodly situations, the Bible says they are all set up by the Lord. It's all moving his way to work towards his end. And he will come for his people and we know that no, there's no believer we've left in the cemetery that we are not going to see them again, spirit, soul, and body, because as he is rose and says he will return, amen, that is exactly what he's going to do, and our loved ones are going to return with him. Secondly, he says that he will reward. He not only says he will return, but he says that he will reward. The Lord knows. The Lord knows the bad, and praise God, the Lord knows the good. It is a good thing to be in the graces of a great king. How much better is it to be in the good graces of the king of kings? Amen? Amen. We can believe God for big things. God is going to do more for us than we think that he's going to do. Eyes not seen, ears not heard, and it's never entered into our hearts the things God has prepared for those who love him. God is going to be better to us than what we can even imagine. And I can imagine some pretty big things in heaven. But the Bible says it, it you know, it just, it, it all fails in comparing to what he's really going to do because God is better than we think he is. And lastly there, Jesus says that he has the right. 
He says that he's going to return. He says he's going to reward. And he backs up that statement by claiming the right to do it. When he says he's going to return, he's basically saying, I'm going to step down into the middle of y'all's situation. I'm going to change it. If he steps down tonight, it's going to change the world dynamic. We read the book of Revelation, and we see judgments coming. And what is the one thing that keeps coming behind those judgments? Acclamation of what? Lord, you're righteous. Lord, you've been just to do this right. When the Lord, when the Lord took the title deed to the universe, he claimed all the right and privilege of controlling the future. Okay? Somebody says, well, why is it that way? Because this is the way the Lord has laid it out. And you say, well, I don't like that. Well, too bad. Because the Lord here, the Lord knows our pride, and he asserts his position, and he asserts his domination. And that's why I believe he backs it with verse 13. I'm going to return. My reward is with me. And, and know this, I'm the Alpha and I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. It's all in me. It's all about me. You are, all your blessings flow from me. Every, every answer Christ is saying here is in me. Of course, I, I pray you probably already know this, but just to make sure you're clear, the Alpha and the Omega, Alpha and Omega are the first and last verse, uh, verse first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So what he's basically saying here is I'm the A to Z, okay, in our, in our way of understanding it. I'm the A to Z. What does that mean? It means I'm, I'm everything in, in, in between. And he emphasizes it by saying what? I'm the first and I'm the last. And there is nothing that exists apart from me. I have every right, the Lord is saying, to return, to change, to set up, to judge, to bring a tribulation, to allow Satan to rise, to allow him to have his Superman called the Antichrist, and to let him have his false prophets. I will raise them, I will allow them to raise up, and I will destroy them at my good pleasure. I will gather a battle, and I will defeat the enemy. I will set up a millennium. I will lose Satan. I will destroy him at the battle of Gog and Magog. I will judge the lost. I will bless the righteous. I'll do it if I could just paraphrase for the Lord because it's what our cotton picking well want to do and who will stop me now you say well brother Todd is it right are any of his ways unjust are any of his ways unfaithful he's, it's not just he has the power to do it but frankly he's the only one holy enough to bring a good end so he makes a promise that he backs with his power. I've told you this a lot many a time. A promise is meaningless without the power to bring it forth. I can make you all kinds of promises, but do I have the power to bring it forth? When Misty and I was dating, you know, I'd be singing her them songs. I'd tell her, baby, I'll give you the moon. Well, don't that sound good? I mean, sound like a country boy, right? Baby, I ain't got no money, but I'll give you the moon. But I can't reach up and grab the moon and hand it to her. She can't wear it like a, like a stone on a ring. It sounds good, but it's an empty promise. There was some nights I thought that was all we got. We just walk out. We just walk out there and look at the moon, baby. There for you. Those within. See it? Down below verse 14 and 15 on your outline. See where I, I note it out. See where the word within is in bold? Do you see that? Would you circle it? And then if you drift down the page a little further, Verse 15 says, those without. Would you circle it? Those that are within the new city. Those that are within the promises. Those that are within the reward. Are you following me? And there are those that are without. Now, again, he's concluding the book of Revelation. And he has given us this book to have an effect. That is one of the things that gets lost in Christian circles. God gives you his word so that his word does something. He has no interest in us just knowing and not doing anything with it. Do you understand that? The word of God says that knowledge increases sorrow. If knowledge does not move to action, the only things it means is that you are more accountable than you were before you knew 
what you knew. I would rather stand before God an ignorant pagan than somebody who knew the word of God and would not do it, would not follow it, and would not believe it. I think the first person's got a much better chance for mercy than just a straight-out unbeliever. Jesus never said we would be blessed, we would be happy if we knew what he said. What did he say there in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are who? Those who know and do. Those who know and do. He wants it to have an effect. The ultimate effect of listening to the Lord is verse 14. The ultimate effect of rejecting the Lord is verse 15. Now, he can't make it much, much plainer than that. And again, this is the end of the book, and he's trying to, he's giving it to us quick. So if you look at verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. Literally, they have the right to the tree. Those who do his commandments have that right. You say, well, Brother Todd, does this mean that we work our way into salvation? No, it, it doesn't mean that. I mean, I, I give you a verse right there in the, on John 6, verse 28 and 29. They said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Amen. Jesus answered to them, This is the work of God that you believe in who the Father has sent. That's the, that's the work of salvation. Then there are the works of salvation. And the works of salvation ultimately are obedience. Real faith ultimately is obedient faith. I don't want to split a bunch of theological hairs, but a lot of people believe, well, I walked down some aisle and I took some preacher by the hand, therefore I'm saved. But that kind of salvation that never leads to any kind of obedience, how do you even know that's real? I remember one time God was calling me to be saved. I was a boy in church. And was, was Grandpa Peavy's favorite song, He Set Me Free? I think it was. That my Grandpa Peavy was the meanest man to live in Kaufman County. My other grandpa said he was the cussingest man he'd ever met. And my grandpa worked with mechanics and machinists for 50 years and, and ran a bunch of them at work, okay? And, you know, just he said he's the cussingest man ever lived. He drank, he fought. It was, uh, I mean, he was, he was illiterate and, and rough. Now, he was a good farmer, but, but boy, he was, he was hard, hard. And he spent his life that way, and he got saved. And you just heard Mimi say got saved. I mean, he got that kind of saved. Got saved, no drinking. Got saved, no cussing. God blew cussing, drinking all out of his life right then. He said, Brother Todd, I wish I didn't have that struggle. Well, you might not want it because I think God gave it to him for them to enjoy because he wasn't going to live long because he died of a brain tumor just a very few short years later, a very, very brief time later. And um, he wasn't sick or anything when he got saved. He just got convicted, and, and God saved him. And, and his favorite song was He Set Me Free, which if you think about the way kind of man he was, it's like a bird in prison. I raised up. No freedom from my sorrow I felt, but it's looking at me like I'm crazy. But anyhow, I, I can't remember the words. So anyway, the uh, I remember him talking about that one, one day. I was a kid, and God was convicting me. And they were singing that song, and somebody in church must have gave testimony about it. And, uh, and I remember being very emotional about it. And God was calling me to be saved, and I even got the goosebumps. And I was emotional about it. What he did for my grandpa, my grandpa being saved, man, died when I was two years old. And I remember sitting there going, wow, this feels so great. I must be saved. And I spent all day convincing myself that I had gotten saved while they were singing that song because of how I felt. But there was no change. There was no surrender. God was calling for me to surrender. God was calling for me to make him known. You've heard my testimony. I've told you that I got saved the minute I was willing to act on my belief. The moment I stepped out is when I know the Lord saved me. And you may have moments. But if those moments don't bring and show forth a difference, what kind of faith is that? Think about it. 
You show me one place in the Bible where somebody got saved and stayed the same. You say, Brother Todd, can we backslide? Yes, we can backslide. He said, Brother Todd, we've got to be perfect all the time. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about that there's an obvious difference. There's, there's something happening. There's a conviction. There's a stirring. There's at least a brokenheartedness over not keeping God's commandments. Does that make sense? I'm saved, but I know I'm not stirred. The only way you can be saved and that really be the reality is for you to become, over time, cold of heart cold of heart what jesus told that one church i wish you were cold or hot cold and cold christians don't make an effect a negative effect on the kingdom because frankly nobody even knows they're saved and if they won't get right god usually brings them to an early grave because they're a, you say brother todd how do you know that john 15 jesus said my father i'm the vine my father's the husbandman and that a branch that does not bring fruit is, is pruned off, is cut off by the, by the Father. Because it's what? What did he say? Good for what? Nothing. And these are the people that are saved as yet by fire. You're not here on Wednesday night because you're interested in that kind of life. And so we see here, we see the, 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 they, they, there is an effect made and those who keep the commandments of God, what did Jesus say? He said, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I've loved you. He said, Brother Todd, that's, that wasn't a new commandment because people were supposed to love each other, but how did Jesus put it? As I've loved you, self-sacrificially. I'm high, but I've made myself low. I've been patient with you. I've cared for you. I have taught you. Do with other people, the, bear with other people the way I've, 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 I've bore with you. The, all of those things, are, are those who are, are those are pictures of people who are saved and those people there on your outline they are given access and ability we are given the access to come into the new city and we are given the power to enter the city to eat from the tree of life you have to have both you have to be you have to have access to the lord and you have to have the ability to come before the lord and both of those are given by christ that, 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 is, that is so much of what was happening when the Lord tore the veil in two when he died on the cross and the veil of the temple was torn in two. He was telling people, God, is now you have access. Now you can come. What do I bring? I bring the blood of Christ. That's my capacity. That's my ability. I don't bring my works. I bring Jesus' work. Does that make sense? Verse 15, there are those that are without, but outside are dogs. And if you really want to afflict the dog lover, show them here that dogs don't go to heaven and they go nuts. And that's not what it means, unless you get upset with me. I've just seen some people <laughs> aggravated by it. We don't be aggravating people with Scripture. So let me, just, let me just say don't do that. The dogs here is, most of the time you will see this modernly translated perverted person. Now a lot of times you will see this referencing homosexual prostitutes okay and so just a multiplied perversions of god's uh intention for sex and that kind of thing but it but it's not just that you'll have some that say it's just that but that's i i, I don't i don't not from what i've studied i don't see that in the wording but it definitely does not talk about fido and and rover it's talking about it's talking about people that are that are that are twisted. Stay lost, you'll get twisted. Be lost, deal with this lost society. Live in this lost culture, and it will twist everything. And that's what we're dealing with in America today. It, it's just the total blurring, the total twisting. Because if if there's not a light to point you in the right way, people go all kinds of ways. And we ultimately, we ultimately lived like they did in the day of the judges, and each man did what was right in his own eyes. And we live in a society today that says amen to that, and that's what you ought to do, because really ain't that really what truth is? It's only true if it's true to you, but it may not be true to me. And if, if you're a boy who thinks you're a girl, and half the day you're a girl, and half the day you're a boy, and you want to blur lines and that kind of thing, that's all okay. The sad thing of that is, is it is it's, it's a spinning off. When things go reprobate, 
they twist off in all kinds of different ways and they manifest themselves in in every uh type of twist and that's what perversion means it just it means twisted it's been away from from truth and so we see we see their sorcerers they're 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 hung up uh on the on the evil side they're sexually immoral they're murderers they they they, they, they worship idols uh and of course like we've already studied here liars are mentioned again and um, I wouldn't want to be a habitual liar and be part of this study of the book of Revelation because you see them lumped in with some very, very bad people. But ultimately, the consequence is what? Those who know the Lord are within. Those who don't know the Lord are without. And what? It says they are outside. They're outside. They have no power on your outline to enter. You have to be, like we've already looked at in verse 14, you have to be given ability. Mankind does not have the ability to come before a holy God on their own. They have no power to enter, and they have no claim for entering. They can, they can make no real... Don't turn your page over yet. We've got one more thing to fill in. I wrote it in visible ink. I'm not kidding. We got a blank fart and everything. It's coming up here in a minute. My mom leads the charge to flip that over every time. Do you give out a signal, Mindy? Like, Mindy's turning hers. We can turn ours. But they, but they, they have no basis. They have no basis. You see, all the world will get all bent out of shape for me saying only Christians go to heaven. And they'll get all bent out of shape and like, well, all mans deserve it. No, 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 man deserves hell. You seen what people do to each other? Look at, look, what do you, I guess we can use the term relatively innocent. Some people are not as wicked as others, but wickedness is just wickedness. If, if heaven is the home that Christ Jesus has prepared for those who love him who else can come and make a claim and say well i belong there too when he says here's the way to my house and it's through me when we when we die and we stand before the lord guys our only claim is that we've been saved by the blood of the lamb we haven't brought any of our own works we haven't we know we're not able to do anything but christ was able to do and Christ is in us. And I'm telling you now, you stand before the fa- Father God like that, and you're going to be okay. You don't bring anything else. Just, just Him. What would you pour into His sacrifice? What would you pour into His sacrifice that wouldn't putrefy? You ever, you ever, read, about a, you ever read about a wise man over in, in Ecclesiastes? Like like a fly in the perfumer's ointment is an old man given to a little folly. You've lived your life, you've got a good reputation, but you got one bad spot, and it's like putting a fly in the perfume. Could I interest y'all in some perfume like that, ladies? It's the, of the best stock. It's just got a few flies in it. No, it sounds gross, Brother Todd. Thank you. I'll pass. Well, anything we would put into what the Lord has done for us is worse than a fly in the perfume. You may, y'all follow what I'm saying? It taints it. It taints it. If I gave you a bowl of soup and spit in it and then told you, guys, well, well hold on a minute. Why aren't you eating that? It's, I just put a little, it's a big bowl. I just put a little spit in it. I mean, you, it's, do your best to eat around it. No, you would say, oh, thank you, Brother Todd. Because now, but, but when we, y'all follow, y'all follow my logic? Don't stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I know you died for me and I did the best I could because that's spitting in the soup. Just know that you can lay on your deathbed and say, Lord, I wish I was better than what I have been, but you know my heart. I know you. 
I love you. I want you. I want, I need no other. I'm not bringing my scepter. I'm not bringing my money. I'm not bringing my good works. I'm bringing you. You can die with confidence like that. But if you're trying to get there based on anything you've done, you're going to lay on your deathbed and see 10 million regrets. Y'all following me? Don't bring that. They have no claim. There's no blood covering their sins. Their sins are, are, are glaring. And they're before the Father. And who can walk in a holy city that's not holy? What's the real problem? And what's written in invisible ink there at the bottom of your page? Would you just write down the word unchanged? That's the real problem. The real problem is not that they were perverted. The real problem is not that they were sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, adulterers, and liars. These are the natural results of being lost. But if they had been changed, they would have access to the city. Because nobody that's going to be in the city has changed themselves from these things that lie in all of us. By our religion, our, y'all follow me, right? We all, everybody in here would say amen, but maybe if there's somebody here that thinks you, you, can't, you can't work it in, you have to be changed. The only difference between those of us in heaven one day and those that are in hell is that they were unchanged and we were changed. Don't, don't live unchanged. Now turn your pages. Thank you, Mimi. Mimi said it's okay. Now the Lord interjects again. And having made this statement about his promised return, about his reward being with him, and about the reality that there is an in and there is an out, he states uh, once again who he is and why he's done what he's done. If you'll look closely, you'll see three names in the verse, right? I, say it with me, I, Jesus, right? I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the and offspring of David and the what? The bride and morning star. That's three names. It's three claims. I, the first name he uses is Jesus. The second name he uses is root and offspring of David. And the third name that he uses for himself is bride and morning star. Why does God give us names and why does God give us his names at different times in Scripture? So that we what? Know something. Right? Those names are descriptive. The name Jesus is the name that he used here on the earth. It was the name that he carried to the cross. We know it means it was not a name that Mary and Joseph picked out. Right? Stephanie and Mason were two days name and mile. They didn't break my record because I was three days naming Mason. Me and Misty were. I think it's what he was trying to do, but but Stephanie wouldn't let him do it no more. But anyway, the angel gave them the name Jesus, right? Which means what? Jehovah is salvation. That's what Jesus means. It's the what's the Old Testament way it would have been pronounced. What was Jesus' name? If he'd, have, if he'd have been running around with Moses, what would, it, what would they have called Jesus? Joshua. Joshua. Jesus is just the Hellenized version of the word Joshua. Okay? Joshua means, and they didn't pronounce it with a J. Only English people do that. Right? Javier, speaking in his, in his native language, doesn't pronounce a J as a J. Right? It's a, either a Y or an H sound, right? I went to school with a guy named Daniel. We thought his name was Jiminy. That's what we called him. His name was Hermanus. But none of us knew, and he said he got tired of telling white people <laughs> different. So he just, he just went along with it. But So it was Yahweh, Yahshua, 
When Mary stepped out the door and called Jesus in for dinner, she called, she called her Yeshua. But what it means is what? Jehovah is, say it with me, Jehovah is salvation. That's the name Jesus was going to go by when he came to this earth. 700 different names, titles applied to Jesus Christ in scriptures for the Lord and or the Son of, uh, uh, of God. Y'all following me? But the one he picked out was what? I want you to know that I am God, and I want you to know I'm here to save. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. The next name is Root and Offspring of David, and the third one is Bright and Morning Star, and those names are very descriptive, aren't they? Well, why is he giving us descriptive names? So we'll, so we'll know him, and so we'll understand what he's saying, right? So look at, look at there at the back of your outline. What is the emphasis of Christ's music? What is Jesus emphasizing? If you Guys, and I know we're running through it on Wednesday night, but there are no greater consequences than verses 14 and verse 15. Think about it. You're in or you're out. You're in heaven or you're in hell. You've been changed or you've been left unchanged. Okay? I mean, those are, those are huge statements when we really think about all of humanity fit into one of those two verses. Billions of people fit into one of two verses. Okay? And so he comes back and he, he authenticates that decision. He authenticates that reality based on who he is and he and what he does is he emphasizes who he is there on your outline we use we see the name jesus and that emphasizes his might his might his ability this name does a couple of things more but we ain't got all we ain't got all the time in the world this name rem removes any doubt it removes any doubt of who's doing this. It removes any doubt of who's in charge. Again, we live in a pluralistic world that has adopted a monotheistic ultimate end, but a pluralistic avenue to get there. What do I mean by that? Here's a common American statement. We're all trying to get to God. God's up on the mountain. We're all trying to get to God, and there's a lot of roads to get to God. There's Jesus. There's, Hin there's Hinduism. There's, there's Buddha. There's Confucius, right? There's all these ways, but ain't at the end, ain't we all trying to really get to the same end? What this verse does is it, it, it removes any doubt about who God is, and it removes any doubt about who Jesus is because what Jesus is saying is, is I'm the one who's coming back. I'm the one who's going to set the agenda. And I'm the one who's the all and in all. I'm the one who's going to change righteous, and I'm the one who's going to judge the law. Not Hinduism, not Buddhism, not, not Muhammad, me. Because he could have just said, I've sent my angel to testify to you these things, but he inserts the name. And it's Jesus speaking. This is the Son of God stepping over the angel again. The angel has said, everybody within is going to be blessed. Everybody without is going to be judged. And the Lord says, I, Jesus, sent this angel to tell you this. I did it. He's speaking for me. I sat on the throne. Jesus never, never steps away from who he is. He may have humbled himself to save us. He don't step away from who he is, and why should he? And praise God that he doesn't. If he was to step away, we'd have no light. Jesus, this is speaking about his might. This name removes any doubt of who this is, of whose message this is, and of whose revelation this is, and it reminds of, us of his power and his desire. It reminds us of his power and desire. And in the name Jesus, it reminds us primarily of his power and desire to do what? To, to save. Because it's I, Jesus. I, Yeshua. 
Ah, the one who is the ultimate Jehovah is salvation. I'm it. Okay? So it emphasizes, it reminds us of his cross. Verse 14, all depends on the cross. Those within, all de- those that have been to the cross are within. And those that hadn't been to the cross are without. It's simple. But praise God for the cross. Amen? Praise God that he, that he sought and saved us. Amen? His name removes any doubt. It reminds us of his power and his desire. And if you want to write out there, to save. Because that's what I got written on my outline. The second name is the root and offspring of David. This speaks of his right. This speaks of his right. And that is. Uh, or basically of his authority, okay, to save, to, to conclude the world's affairs, to write the world's agenda. That is a neat name. I am the root and offspring of David. So you say, but now hold on a minute, Brother Todd. Does that, is that talking about him being the root of David? Is that talking about like how when it was talking about out of a stump, out of the stem of Jesse, even though it looked like Israel was cut off, that Jesus was going to come back and, and, uh, and be the Messiah out of what looked like a dead line, a lineage, a line of lineage. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It's about to be Christmas, right? Amen? So when you're reading Matthew, right, and the Christmas story is in more detail in two books, Luke and in Matthew, right, and Matthew is... is, is is here comes your king, is what Matthew's saying. And a king needs a genealogy. A king needs a right to reign, right? So he begins with a genealogy, right? And he talks about the Jesus, the son of da- the son of Abraham, the son of, of David, right? So he connects him to what? Two covenants, right? The Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. Just nod your head even if you don't know what I'm talking about. Just, just right? And then he gives the line and lineage through Abraham, from the beginning of faith to David, to the beginning of the promise that that one of David's lineage would always rule on the throne, ultimately rule forever, that's Jesus, okay? And you see all those kings. But about the time they're carried away into captivity, we start running into a bunch of names we can't pronounce because we don't know them. I mean, Uzziah looks like a crazy name, but if you say it enough times, well, we've read about King Uzziah, and we've read about King Hezekiah, but then there's, 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 there's a generation, 14 generations, nobody knows them because it was cut off. And when Jesus was born to a carpenter in Bethlehem, the Davidic line looked dead. That's what it means, a, out of the stem of Jesse, Right? And the righteous branch would grow out of what looked like a stump, but that's not talking about that. That doesn't say the stump and offspring of David. It says the what? The root. I'm the beginning. I'm the beginning of David. And I am his offspring. You want to pop your cork? Read Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, right? Bring up uh, Psalms uh, 110, verse 1, Brother David. The Lord said to my Lord, set at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He is, he is under authority and he's in authority. And isn't that how Jesus came? Under authority, in authority. He came in the line and lineage of David, but he's also David's beginning. He came in the line of Abraham, but before Abraham was, Jesus says, I am. So he's, as as God in the heavens, what he's saying is, I'm the originator of your promises. I'm the originator of your covenants. And the Davidic covenant, praise God, is an unconditional covenant. It is a promise God made to man with no condition about man's reaction and, and obedience to God. It's two big unconditional covenants. 
and they're the ones I talked about there in Matthew. The, the Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional covenant. The Davidic covenant is an unconditional covenant. Our salvation is based on an unconditional covenant. God makes promises to us because it's God making promises to us, and we don't have to keep them. The Mosaic covenant was what? It was a covenant that was conditional. If you do this, I'll do this, and if you do that, I'm going to do that. Right? That's the, kind of, that's the kind of promises we tend to make. As long as you act the way I want you to act, I'm going to be nice to you, but if you don't do me right, I'm going to do you wrong. Because the Lord says, no, 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 it's, it's going to come. So we, as he talks about back in, Psalm, uh, in Revelation 22, uh, verse 16, he's emphasizing the fact that as God, he originated all of our promises, and as the offspring of David, he's the one who carried them out. He is the originator. He is the completer. I don't know how I put it in my outline. This name makes a claim. As the root, he's the originator. As the offspring, he's the completer. He originates a plan, and he carries out the plan. It's like him being the high priest and the lamb. The scripture says both. He brings the sacrifice, the sacrifice of who? The sacrifice of himself. That makes sense? It's pretty deep. The bright and morning star is talking about his light, and I'm sure you already filled that one in. Because if I was you, I'd already done it. Just to show the preacher I knew what was coming up. I love to do that to Brother Jim. I'll see something start with S, and I start scoping out them verses. I said, I'll bet that means surrender. You know, I try to fill them in beforehand. The offspring, the bright, and the morning star. Now, that is obviously talking about his clarity. It's obviously talking about direction. There on your outline, note this name is not only the name of direction and clarity. He's the bright and morning star. He shines into our darkness. He is the one who came to us, showed us the light, and we end up in verse 14. It's because he showed us how to get there, and he is what is there. Okay, but it's also a name of victory. It's also a name of victory. And think about it a minute, and let's look at two verses of Scripture, two passages there on your outline. First, look at the second one I listed for you, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. So we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and morning the morning star rises in your heart. This is, this is talking about the clarity. It's talking about the direction. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? John 8, 12. I'm the light of the world. I'm, I, I will bring my word, is what Peter's talking about here, is it comes forth for me, and it's a light that shines in a dark place, and w ultimately the day's going to dawn and the morning star is going to rise in your heart because if we'll follow the Lord as God gives us understanding, we're going we're gonna to ultimately, ultimately be before his throne in a good position. But it's also a name that reflects the power of the Lord and the ability of the Lord and the victory the Lord gives. I quote to you from Numbers 24, 17, the reluctant prophet named Balaam, B-A-L-A-A-M, Anybody know what very weird thing happened to Balaam? His donkey talked to him. Balak of Moab had called out Balaam, who was obviously a prophet, to come and curse the children of Israel because the children of Israel were doing whatever they pleased as they traveled through the land, and they had absolutely just annihilated the Amorites. And the Moabites was all shook up about it. And he says, well, what I need I obviously can't beat, I'm going to paraphrase, I can't beat these people on the battlefield. But I tell you what I can do, I can get this prophet from God to come out here and curse these people. And so he was going to pay him a good sum to come and curse him. Remember? But every time Balaam tried to curse Israel, he blessed them. Remember? And finally, he just ultimately said, I can't, I can't say but what I see. And one of the things he said was this. I see him. Talking about the Lord. I'm talking about Jesus in particular. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. Now, what's that mean? 
It means Bubba's going to be 1,500 years till Jesus comes. A star shall come out of Jacob. What's Jacob's name that God gave him? Israel, right? It means the same. A scepter shall rise out of, the, out of Israel. A scepter is what a king holds in his hand. Uh, to, and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of tumult or of riot or of uproar. Edom shall be a possession. Seir also is a capital. His enemy shall be a possession while Israel does valiantly. Out of Jacob one shall have dominion and destroy the remains of the city. Talking about the Lord coming and, and executing his will. But what's he called? A star. The light. Day star, the bright and morning star. It's talking about like how the sun comes up in the morning and the darkness flees from it. Does that make sense? This name there on your outline is not just the name of direction and clarity, but it's also of victory. And on the bottom of your outline, and if you think about it, victory is exactly where he takes it. Overcoming is exactly where the Lord brings it. Power, position, is exactly where the Lord brings it. Guys, we're headed for a land. We're headed home. Our God's got this. Our God is not going to fail in this. He's going to overcome, and we are going to overcome with Him. What is it that overcomes the world? Even our faith, as we trust in God, God is going to overcome. God is going to come through. We don't always know what's going to happen, but we have a confidence. We may feel the stress and burden of the reality that we're dealing with, but we have a confidence and a hope. We know we're going through. We know we're going home. We don't, live, we don't need to live in fear. We shouldn't have any fear. You know, there's been some horrible things spoken in the book of Revelation that's going to happen to this world. They ought to cause a certain amount of consternation. They're running around in the streets in America now all upset about who's about to be president. They ought to be upset about who's coming. These, these things are real, but we're in Christ. So I've got to ask the question, are you in Christ? Verse 14 and verse 15 is the ultimate reality of mankind. You will find yourself in one of those two verses. You might not find yourself in every verse of the Bible, but you will find yourself in verse 14, those within, or verse 15, those without. If you're in Christ today, you're going to be within that city. And if you're without Christ today, you won't even be able to approach it. And that's a reality, and if the Lord's speaking to you, you know that. And the other thing you know is that you need to act on it. And what I just want to ask tonight is, is have you acted on the revelation that Christ has given you? And if you have, by being saved, then let's go forth and serve our King. And if not, come to Him tonight. Would you bow your head with me? Would you close your eyes? Can I ask you that very simple question, are you saved? I want to thank you again for being a part of the service today. I hope that something in the message spoke to you. Not the kind of speaking to you of just a man making a speech to an audience, but the kind of speaking that God does as he uses his word to speak into our lives. You know, the Bible says that the, the word of God will never return to God empty. And I pray that the message we've that you've listened to today and been a part of today is going to be something that God is going to use to pour good things into your life. If you're already a believer in Jesus Christ, I pray the message today inspired you, challenged you, convicted you to go out and do wonderful and great things as you follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that you trust him in the circumstances and situations of life and see that if he doesn't work out a great plan in a good way. If you've never really made Christ your Savior, if you're, there's never been a time where you've really become a believer in Jesus Christ, not about him, but really trusting in him. I want to ask you 
today during the message or maybe even right now, was there a time and is there a time where you, you sense and know that God is calling you, that he's speaking to you, that he's drawing you as it were? Jesus said that unless the Father draws a person, they can't come to him. God gives us this call to give us an opportunity. You know, the truth is God doesn't have to call us to judge us. He calls us so that good things can happen in our life. When that call happens, usually two things are going to happen in somebody's life. There's going to be a convicting. There's going to be a stirring. Uh, the reality that we're sinners starts really moving in us, and we recognize a holy God is talking to us, and sometimes we feel ashamed. Sometimes we just feel like we don't measure up. But, the, but the, the good thing about that is that God is letting us know there's a problem. And he's letting us know that his son is the solution. Jesus Christ himself said, I came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. And so if God is drawing you, he's drawing you from the problem to a solution. And I pray today that, that as you sense that calling and maybe you're, as you're dealing with that conviction, that you won't stop there, that you won't just end this, this time with us together today just being convicted, but that you would rather hear that second part that, that God is speaking to, to you about, and that is that His Son is the answer. His Son dying for you on the cross is what pays for your sins. His Son rising from the grave is what justifies us and gives us life. That's what the Bible tells us, that Christ was accomplishing for us. You know, the fact, in fact, the Bible says that he who knew no sin, speaking of Jesus, became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ died on the cross to be our substitute, to take our place and to pay our price. And I hope as God is calling you today that you're being aware of that. And if you recognize that sin's a problem, and if you recognize that Christ is the solution, I hope that you'll take the next step, and that is to believe enough to act. The Bible tells us that the, the way to do that is to pray. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible says, whoever will confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, they will be saved. And so I pray today that, that you're willing to take that next really big step of becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, really trusting in him. In just a few moments, if God is calling you to be saved, I'm going to lead a prayer uh, that I would encourage you to pray. Now, I want to be the first person to tell you, uh, and I think you probably realize this, that you, don't, you wouldn't be saved, you wouldn't be made holy in God by just repeating after some preacher on the Internet. There's got to be some faith there. There's got to be some real belief there. And I'm offering this prayer to you today as a guide. If you mean what you say to God based on the authority of the Word of God, I know that God will save your soul. He'll save your spirit. He'll, he'll, the Bible tells us that He justifies our spirit. He sanctifies our mind. And He one day will glorify our flesh. God will do great things in us beyond what even we can, the Bible says, even hope or imagine. So if you know God's calling you to be saved and you want to become a follower of Jesus Christ, I would encourage you now, right where you're at or whatever device or computer you're, you're watching on, to just bow your head and close your eyes and take a moment and think about God. And as you think about Him, just say to Him uh, with, with all your understanding and, and with all your trust, just say something like this to Him. Just say, Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I know I cannot save myself. But with all of my heart, I believe that you died for me, and I believe you rose from the grave to give me life. I want to understand it more, and I want to grow in it. I ask you today to forgive me of my sins. I want to turn from them, and I want to turn to you. I ask you to cover them and remove them from my life. I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord, and I want you to be my Savior because I need you. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so if you just lift up your eyes and kind of look at the screen again or just begin to listen a little bit, I want to talk to you about that prayer you just prayed. If you meant what you said to God as God was calling you, then based on the authority of the Word of God, which says things like this, that for as many people as have received Him, to them He has given the power to be the children of God and to everyone who believes on His name. Again, like I've already said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Based on the authority of the Word of God, I want to congratulate you for becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, what you did today is the first step, and it's the big step, but there's a lot of things you need to do in your life to really begin to grow. Uh, I know that as this broadcast goes out over the Internet, it, it lands in a lot of different places. 
Some of you may be around churches. You may be where churches, genuine churches that preach Christ and, and, and are authentic. Maybe you, you know of one of those. Maybe you can attend one of those. And you need to go to that church and let them know what you've done today. Uh, but regardless, uh, maybe you're in a land where there, there are no churches right now, or you sure can't find any believers. You may be the first in your area, and, and that's okay too. God knew you were going to be that person before uh, any of us were ever born. I just want to, I want to encourage you to follow up and, and to let somebody know. You know, Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father and the angels in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father and the angels of heaven. It, you, it's important to let it, to let it be known what God has done in your life. Somewhere on the website that where you, you found this broadcast or somewhere on a banner or somewhere around, uh, on the screen, uh, there will be the phone number, the address, the email address of our church. I want you to, I want to really encourage you to let us know what you've done today. We want to try to help you, whether it's help you find a church or encourage you in your new walk to let you know what you need to do. You need the help of other brothers and sisters in Christ. And the reality is that's what you are now. You're part of the kingdom of God and you've been made new in him and you're part of what he's doing. And we want to help you just like somebody helped me in my life. Uh, I want to be a part of, of helping you in yours. So it's really important to, uh, to contact us. You can contact us through email. Uh, if you're where you can make a phone call, uh, whatever, somebody will be returning it. Somebody will be talking to you. Uh, but the main thing is just to, is to follow up and, and to be encouraged and to realize that God called you to do great things in you. Don't ever forget that. God called you to make you part part of his family, to be a part of his kingdom, and he does great things in his people, and he has great plans for his kingdom. So I'm so glad that you've prayed and asked Christ to be your Savior. Be sure and follow up. Really begin to grow in Christ. If you can find a Bible, you get it, you start reading it, and God will bless you, and he'll speak more to you just like he's spoken to you today. Now we'll be, uh, Lord willing, we'll be back on this channel, so to speak, uh, about the same time every week. And we encourage you, if you can, to be a part of the broadcast every week. Uh, God bless you, and I pray that, that you'll be trusting Him uh, to do great things in your life.